Dr. Chris Kenobi, welcome to the Keto Camp Podcast. I'm so excited to have you here. Thanks for having me on, Ben. It's an honor and a pleasure. It, it is mine as well. I was just telling you offline that I've been a huge fan of your work and I've been wanting you to come on the show for a very long time. And it's perfect timing because you have a brand new book that's out, which we'll, we'll talk about. And you've done an extensive amount of research on PUFAs, uh, linoleic acid, vegetable oils. And we're going to take a deep dive. So those, for those watching and listening, like take a whole bunch of notes, rewatch, re-listen. This is going to be a deep dive. We're going to extract some golden nuggets from your book. But let's rewind before we get to that, Chris, because you have a, a pain to purpose story like many of my guests do, where you had a lot of health challenges and you were trying to figure out the puzzles to that piece, uh, the pieces of the puzzle, and uh, you came across some of the answers. So go ahead and share your story. Yeah, Ben, <clears throat> my, uh, my you know, research, my interest in nutrition really was born out of... Um, out of my own suffering. And um, I, I won't spend too long talking about this because uh, people have probably, you know, have probably who heard me before have heard this before, but, but really it was uh, born out of my own suffering, mostly with arthritis um, over the years. And, um, you know, p people who actually saw me a few years ago also know that uh, you know, it's kind of embarrassing, but my hair was dark because I my hair went, started going gray when I was 14 years old. Um, and I started, you know, when I was a freshman in college, I started coloring my hair because uh, I was tired of people telling me I had gray hair. And um, and then I started getting arthritis in my early 30s. It became progressive and just really became severe by the time I was 50. And um, you know, I'd seen many, many physicians uh, over the years for my arthritis and received all the standard treatments, non steroidal anti inflammatories, um, steroid injections. Um, uh, but nothing ever really helped except just very, you know, short term. And um, eventually I, I came across the paleo diet, which was not that long ago, it was in 2011 for me. And some changes in my diet just made a massive difference and um, just in a few days just in in about seven to ten days my arthritis was improved by about 80 percent and wow. it, th this has been another complicated story which i won't go into right now ben but but um i after after that change in my arthritis and the fact that i'd probably seen at least 15 colleague physicians at that time, orthopedic surgeons, family docs, internists, a, rheum a rheumatologist, and no one had ever even suggested that uh, dietary change might have any effect whatsoever. And this was so um, extraordinary to me that I then, because it was paleo that was helping me at the time, I, I read Lauren Cordain's book, The Paleo Answer, and um, it, I was just absolutely blown away that all of this chronic disease, heart disease to, to diabetes, obesity, and so forth could be related to processed foods. But there was, there were things, you know, that uh, about Lauren Cordain's hypothesis and his research that I wasn't really in agreement with, for example, saturated fat didn't, didn't make any sense to me that that was, um, could be a problem. And um, so I, I eventually came across Weston Price's research in 2013, um, and, and probably most of your listeners already know Weston Price's research, so I won't go into that, but it, but it taught me that the fundamentals that I live by today, which is that it is primarily processed foods, refined flours, refined sugars, and vegetable oils that are the primary drivers. It's processed foods. and and I'm an ophthalmologist by training and had a full career in ophthalmology. Um, I left ophthalmology in 2015 because in 2013, it had occurred to me that processed foods and, well, whatever those contain might be the drivers of age-related macular degeneration, AMD, which is the leading cause of irreversible vision loss and blindness in people over the age of 50 worldwide. And you know, if you talk to ophthalmologists or optometrists, you'll know that we see, and it, you, we may see multiple patients with macular degeneration on a typical day, but it turns out that in the 19th century, this disease was extraordinarily rare. Hmm. 
In fact, in the first 80 years of potential discovery between 1851 and 1930 approximately, there was no more than 50 cases of macular degeneration in all of the world's literature. And yet today, Ben, as of 2020, there's estimated to be 196 million people with macular degeneration, Gosh. 288 million expected to have macular degeneration by 2040. And of those, way back in 2006, the World Health Organization had already estimated that 14 million people were bilaterally either blind or severely visually impaired from macular degeneration. So we have millions of people today blind from macular degeneration and, um, and, and yet the disease was virtually unknown for an 80 year period um, between 1851 and 1930. All right, so, so I put, I left practice, put all of my efforts into researching this with, with some colleague ophthalmologists in the South Pacific and one nutrition researcher, Maria Stoyanowska from Macedonia, who helped me in, intensively for a couple of years. And uh, anyway, we, we researched um, the uh, consumption of sugar and vegetable oils in, um, in 25 nations in relation to the prevalence of macular degeneration. And the data fit the hypothesis in every single case. It was, yeah, as the vegetable oils and sugars went up, so did the vegetable oils. I mean, so, so did the macular degeneration. Yeah. The vegetable oils in three Pacific islands, um, Solomon Islands, uh, Kir Kiribati, and uh, Samoa, they were exceedingly low, almost zero, and those islands have almost no macular degeneration. It's like 0.2% of people over the age of, of uh, 60. And did, they consume, and did they consume sugar? Only one, Kiribati. Um, and for those who want to look this up, it look, look, looks like Kiribati is what I thought the, the pronunciation was. It's K-I-R-I-B-A-T-I, -I -I. and Kiribati, um, has about a population of about 115,000 back in 2015. And they had one ophthalmologist for the entire population. And he saw two cases of macular degeneration in that year, 2015. Wow. And they had pretty high sugar consumption, 60 to 80 uh, grams per, per person per day through a lot of those decades. But they had almost no vegetable oil and they just had almost no... Uh, macular degeneration. And so anyway, so this is the path I went down, Ben, was this until about 2018, 2019. I just became, you know, con more and more convinced that it was the vegetable oils and the high omega-6 that were the primary drivers of all this chronic disease. And I saw there was f precious few people that were, were you know, were pursuing this. Um, and so I, I uh, and I'm a data junkie and I, and anybody who looks at my work or looks at this coming book or my past book will see that if I can't show that the data supports it, I'm not going to, I'm not, I won't present it. Um, and so anyway, but, but so in 2019, I started presenting on uh, the correlations and the causation that the, the, the what, what I believe is the causation between vegetable oil consumption, high omega-6 diets, and all of this chronic disease, coronary heart disease, strokes, cancer, type 2 diabetes, metabolic syndrome, Alzheimer's, dementia, macular degeneration, of course, autoimmune diseases, and the list goes on and on. So that's where I been, basically have been in the last uh, number of years. So, so now, now this, this is what I do. I consider myself a nutrition researcher and a public health advocate. That's mm. what I do today. And so we run two, two nonprofit organizations. Um, I, I do not get paid to do this work. Um, I, just so any, anyone knows, I don't have any agendas. I don't care what the answers are. I care about what the effects are and how that affects uh, the, the, you know, the people around the world. So I'm here for your listeners. I'm here for the viewers. I'm here for anyone who cares to listen. Um, or, or who is interested in their health, this is what I do. Hey, I wanna just briefly interrupt the video you're watching to share something with you. One of my favorite companies that I use for health and longevity and biohacking is a company called Bond Charge. And they have a whole range of incredible products, including the blue light blocking glasses you see me wear right now. But one of my favorite products from them 
is an infrared sauna blanket. That's right. Uh, you don't have to spend a ton of money investing in a sauna or spending so much time driving to a facility with the sauna. They actually created a sauna blanket that you could use in the comfort of your own home. And I use this all the time. Why would we want to even do a sauna? Well, there's a lot of research and a lot of studies showing the benefits of infrared sauna. The sauna blanket works by raising your heart rate to a workout or a training session. So you burn more calories while you're actually lying down and relaxing. You could burn up to 600 calories in one single session. Also, it's gonna cause you to sweat. And one method of flushing out toxins from your body is through sweat. There's also one of my favorite benefits, this endorphin release, endorphin rush you get from using a sauna blanket. And I, every time I get out of the sauna blanket, I feel like I just got a 60 minute massage. And uh, that's because of the endorphin benefit from it. So how this works differently than a regular sauna is that it works by using infrared light, which heats the body directly rather than the air around you like a traditional sauna. This means you get the same benefit at a lower heat. So it's easy to set up. It's super convenient. 30 to 40 minutes uh, will suffice in terms of the length of the sessions. And you do that two to three times a week, you're going to feel amazing. Add that to your keto fasting protocol and watch what it does for your results. You could do it while you watch TV. You could do it while you read a book. I do it while I listen to an audio book. So if you want to learn more about the Bond Charge products, including the sauna blanket, head over to bondcharge.com slash keto camp. And if you use the coupon code keto camp at checkout, you'll get 15% off your sauna blanket. And actually any of their products are 15% off with that code. Bond Charge hooked you up. So head over to that domain or click the link down below and go get your Bond Charge products. All right, let's get back to today's video. Yeah, and I love that you're doing it. We're, we're grateful that you do. Uh, the argument against you know correlate co studies that are just showing correlation is it's not causation, and we get that. But you're also that's the starting point to actually find causation, right? So. And it's a strong, these are strong correlations, not just what you just shared, but you, sh you in your book, you talk about Japan and other countries and strong correlations to really investigate it. But my question to you is this, what's the, what's the pathway? What's the metabolic pathway that makes vegetable oils, linoleic acid, et cetera, cause these diseases? Like what's happening when we take them in our food supply? Right. So um, th there is basically what I would submit as four pillars of hazard when you consume high omega-6. And it's, just, it's not just the seed oils. We can get into that. But that is, the, of, the, of course, the primary driver of the high omega-6 is the seed oils. But, um, but when you consume high omega-6 and these oils, which contain other ingredients we can get to, um, this, these, uh, the omega-6... Uh, and these advanced lipid oxidation components, they accumulate in our bodies. So omega-6 linoleic acid, which is the primary omega-6 fatty acid or fat in, in vegetable oils, it, um, it accumulates in our body fat, in our cellular membranes, and in our mitochondrial membranes. And ultimately, these four pillars of hazard are, it, it, is, it, it sets up an environment uh, for a biological milieu that is pro-oxidative, pro-inflammatory, directly toxic to cells, and nutrient deficient. And I say, when you put these four pillars of hazard together, you have the recipe for metabolic disaster. So the vegetable oils, I call them chronic metabolic biological poisons. So these are not really all that much acute poisons. In other words, if you drink three cups of uh, vegetable oil today, you're not, you're still not going to die. It's a, you know, it's an extraordinary dose, but I don't think it'll kill you most likely, although it will increase your risk of having clots today. Um, but it probably won't kill you. And this is how, you know, vegetable oils have gotten into the food supply, stayed in the food supply, and now increased in the food supply primarily is the fact that they're chronic poisons. And, and so they gradually uh, you know, poison our, our bodies uh, through these mechanisms. And, um, and we end up with a plethora of diseases of you know, many varieties. And you know, if you and I, Ben, eat the exact same diet with the same amount of vegetable oils, and we're both consuming a, you know, a standard American diet, let's say, 
you may be more um, uh, genetically prone to, more gen genetically susceptible to, let's say, cancer. I might be more genetically prone to arthritis or heart disease, right? Or macular degeneration. And this is the thing. So everybody indeed has genetic susceptibilities. I admit that. And, but, but it is environment that pulls the trigger. And in my view, that environment is roughly, I think, 99% diet. And, uh, and so, you know, the, so the worst possible diet really is a standard American diet because it's high in the vegetable oils, it's high in omega-6, and it's high in the other processed food components, sugars and refined flours and trans fats, which ultimately sets up this kind of an environment. You have c combined nutrient deficiency and toxicity. So uh, from the two of those. So it's the nutrient deficiency from the processed carbs, primarily in my view, and it is the toxicity from the high omega-6. And you just, that, that's, how, that, that's how we end up going down this, this path of, of uh, metabolic disaster. So when we think about this metabolic disaster that we see, uh, Harvard put out an article last year projecting by the year 2030, 50% plus of the adult population in the United States will be classified as obese, not just overweight, but actually obese. So right. there's a few theories out there, and I, I kind of get an idea of where you, you think the, the cause is, but uh, the theories are these to why we have obesity. Mm -hmm. um, seed oils, right? Too many omega-6, PUFAs, et cetera, too much processed sugar. And to your point, some, they usually come packaged together. Uh, not enough protein. We're eat, we're over consuming calories because they're nutrient deficient, trying to get that protein requirement. That's another theory. Another theory is just lack of purpose. You know, the mental stress, you know, makes you eat and kind of fill the hole of not living a life on purpose with your purpose. And then there's a sedentary lifestyle and then genetics. So I know all of these contribute, but which one and why is the biggest driver here? Well, um, if we, Look at, for example, I'll give you, I think, what is, you know, to try to answer this in one fell swoop. You know, first of all, you know, 19th century Americans, the, the obesity was 1.2% in men age 18 to 80. Um, that was Scott, that's Scott Allen Carson's work. He looked at um, male prisoners um, ages 18 to 80 in mostly in uh, Texas and Nebraska uh, prisons. So they measured their height and weight as they came in. Um, and so they could, you could calculate their BMI. And anybody who, if you watch videos um, or look at pictures from the 19th century, you see that you, it, it, it does appear that right around 1% of the people are probably obese. And you have to keep in mind too that being overweight or obese was actually an attractive thing to a lot of people at that time. Um, um, being overweight was consistent with being, um, with being uh, wealthy and because uh, only the wealthy you know could afford to eat that much food essentially mm -hmm. was was the case back then um so so you know what has happened is is that um vegetable oils entered the food supply really in the united states in 1866 right after the american civil war um and they uh, approximately were ranged between about one to two grams um always less than two grams up until 1909 when soybean oil was introduced and Crisco was introduced, which was a, uh, which was made out of cottonseed oil. But anyway, and then, and then there was a, a, a landslide of all these other oils that entered the food supply. Um, so we got, you know, we so I'll just name them soybean, corn, canola, cottonseed, rapeseed, grapeseed, sunflower, safflower, rice bran, sesame, and peanut oils. And think about this up through the American civil war, we didn't have any of those. None of those were in the food supply. The only thing that was possible in America, for example, and we could talk about the whole world too, which is pretty similar, but the only thing that was available generally was olive oil and in incredibly small amounts. Very few people could get, even get olive oil up through the American Civil War in the US. It couldn't be transported those kinds of distances and still be, still be um, worth consuming. Um, and so along with this, obesity has just risen progressively. So obesity went to from 1.2% in the 19th century to the next data we have is 13% in 1960. And then we were at 24% in, around, um, in the late 80s, I think 1988. 
um, at today, if you jump all the way to 2018, it's 42.5%. And if you look at um, the vegetable oil, so we went from zero in 1865 to um, around one gram a day in 1900 to um, 19 and a half grams a day by 1961, all the way to 80 grams a day by 2010. So by 2010, vegetable oils, which didn't exist in, through the American Civil War, now accounted for 32% uh, for of U.S. caloric intake. And um, it, it, that's, that, does, that does not account for losses. So if, there's, if you account for some losses there, it, we, I would estimate at least the typical consumption is at least 24%, if not higher. And a lot of people are consuming one third of their calories coming from vegetable oils. And they really don't realize it because they're not pouring vegetable oil into their food. Um, they are simply getting it from processed foods, from restaurant foods, and from fast foods. All right, and 50% of diet of, of food consumption today is coming from outside the home. So this is where we're getting all these. People don't need to spoon one teaspoon of vegetable oil into their food to get that much. Well, all right, so let's look at that. If you, if you look at sugar, for example, sugar has been in the food supply for hundreds of years, but it was, a, it was a, um, an expensive commodity uh, up until the late 19th century. But Americans loved their sweets. And by 1890, 10.8% of the diet was sugar. And by 1907, it was around 15% of the diet was sugar. 1935, 22.5% of the diet was sugar. Jump all the way to 2016, and sugar is 24% of American calories consumed. So, they, so sugar only went up 1.5% as an absolute percentage of the diet, and it went up 86 calories between 1935 and 2016. All right? An absolute increase of one and a half percent. Vegetable oils in 1935. I'm just using 1935 because it's it. You know, I I know the data from from this era. So 1935, Americans consumed 146 calories of vegetable oil, I believe it was. But by 2010, um, it was 713 calories. Mm -hmm. So so vegetable oils were accounted for seven and a half percent of the diet in 1935, but 29 percent of the diet in 2010, roughly, or uh, okay, or maybe it was 16. But anyway, the, those numbers are approximate, all right? So in other words, while sugar went up between 1935 and 2016, sugar went up 1.5% as an absolute number as a percentage of the diet. Vegetable oils went up 21.5% of the diet. In other words, a fifth of everyone's plate of food for every single meal, 365 days a year, became vegetable oils during this period of time. In other words, we supplanted a fifth of our food consumption with vegetable oils, right? We supplanted one and a half percent with additional sugar. So you tell me, you know, so th this is the thing. And, and since 1999, uh, or at least since 2004, sugar has been on the decline in the United States. Um, while, that, while obesity and diabetes go through the roof. Since 1997, carbohydrates have been on the decline in the United States while obesity and diabetes go through the roof. Since 2002, calories have been going down in the United States while obesity and diabetes and metabolic syndrome and Alzheimer's and dementia and um, what else all goes through the roof, right? So it's a, it, you know, and we can go through this with different countries and everywhere I look, Ben, it's the same thing. So, you know, you, we can, people can talk metabolic pathways all they want to, and you can go on and on with this. And I don't have a problem with anybody doing that. I, I, I commend anybody who wants to try to figure this out by looking at metabolic pathways and, you know, trying to figure out what's causing insulin resistance at the cellular level. But I tell you, you're, 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 into the, you're, you're headed for um, a, a, a mistaken place, I think, generally, when you just look at metabolic pathways because you don't have the evidence. You know, you're not looking at what's happening in the population. And so, you know, and then people will say, you know, as you mentioned early on, Ben, is, um, well, this is a great place to start. We've got, you know, we have, um, population data. We have observational data. So, and people will sometimes say, um, 
well, with observational data, population data, this is a great place to, um, to, de to develop hypotheses, right? And then we can test them in a RCCT, a randomized controlled clinical trial. And to that, I would say, show me a trial that controls a diet for more than six months. <laughs> show me one. There aren't any. You can, you ha to, to control a diet completely, you have to put people into a metabolic ward, right? And you have to control everything they eat and track everything they consume. It's extraordinarily expensive. Um, and you can only do it with a very small number of people for a very short period of time. And even those studies, they haven't tested this hypothesis, you know, this seed oil, like, like you know, Gary Taub's work with the, the uh, NUSI, um, you know, they tested, you know, high carbohydrate versus, you know, um, low carbohydrate diets, right? And, but they weren't really looking at omega-6. So this has really never been tested in people, even over a short period of time. It's been tested in animals. And, and, you know, and if people think that, well, you can't glean evidence from the population, I mean, you can't draw conclusions from the population evidence, I would argue vehemently that you can and that but it is by far and away the best evidence. Just as I was just mentioning, we've got data going back a century and a half. Mm -hmm. And you and, you know, if you when you look at populations at large, it's just like, you know, if, if I say to you, 42 and a half percent of Americans are obese as of 28 as of 2018. Um, that's population evidence that's meaningful, right? And it's the same thing when you look at the diet. If you look at the diet as a whole for the entire nation, there's meaningful evidence there. And I might, you know, for people who want to continue to argue and say, well, well, you know, you, you don't have a randomized controlled clinical trial to prove that, you know, these vegetable oils are driving heart disease, they're driving Alzheimer's, they're driving macular degeneration, they're driving you know, uh, dementia, whatever you want to pick, right? Many of these conditions, first of all, they're, you know, the, the, they have incubation periods. And the incubation period for these diseases, these conditions, is decades, right? Like how many people, ha you know, have a heart attack before age 40? And how many people develop Alzheimer's before age 50 or 60? And this is similar with macular degeneration, how many before age 40, right? You know, so you, so how long would you have to put, you know, put people into a randomized controlled clinical trial in order to have really solid evidence and control their diet? The answer is decades, mm -hmm. right? And, you know, I might take this argument a bit further and say, all right, and they say, we have people say, well, uh, you have to have a randomized controlled clinical trial. Otherwise, you know, you don't have a test that proves, that proves your theory holds water. Right, and I'd say, uh, to that I might say, Ben, I might say, um, well, do you believe smoking causes lung cancer? <laughs> yes. Okay, if you do, um, it, has there been a randomized controlled clinical trial? No. Did we ever take a thousand 13 year olds and put them, you know, randomize them to smoke and another thousand 13 year olds and randomize them not to smoke and follow them for 50 years? Never happened. Right. It never happened. And it, it's obviously not going to. But yet we all know smoking causes cancer. Why? Because if you smoke for 50 years, you take that exact scenario I just presented, you smoke for about 50 or 60 years, your increase in lung cancer will go up 15 to 30 fold and your risk of dying of lung cancer will go up 15 to 30 fold. Okay. 15 to 30 fold. Now, what does, what does this tell us? Well, the people that People that get lung cancer also, some of them don't smoke. They never smoked. True. Yeah. Right? It's one out of 15 to uh, one out of 30, approximately, right? And so um, they never smoked at all. So, how do we, you know, how do we arrive at this conclusion? It's population data and the evidence that we have exactly as you, we can do with the diet. Now, so let's, let's look, let's, you know, apply that to obesity. Right, so we know that obesity since the 19th century, um, between you know 1900 and 2018, obesity has increased 35-fold. It went from 1.2 percent to 42.5 percent. It increased 35-fold. That's a 3,400 percent increase. You know that's higher. That alone is you know worse than the statistics on smoking. 
right? It's a, it, and if you look at coronary heart disease, it was virtually unknown in the 19th century. You know, there's eight papers on coronary heart disease in the entire 19th century. You know, by the 1930s, as vegetable oils, you know, were, were going up in the United States, you know, coronary heart disease became the leading cause of death, right? And has remained so ever since, right? And, um, you know, uh, age-related macular degeneration, dementia, Alzheimer's disease have all gone up exponentially, you know, essentially almost infinitely. Um, they've gone up thousands of fold for sure. So coronary heart disease, um, you know, dementia, Alzheimer's, macular degeneration, these dis disorders have gone up thousands of fold. And you, it, the, the data all there is all there. It's, it's inargu inarguable, right? And so, I, you know, the, these are the arguments I would make to, to, you know, with anybody who believes that we cannot draw causal inference from all of this data. Um, I, I believe that you can, and I make that argument in this book. Yeah, and by the way, the book is called The Ancestral Diet Revolution. I'm holding it up for those watching on YouTube, How Vegetable Oils and Processed Foods Destroy Our Health and How to Recover. And there's a whole bunch of graphs and illustrations, and it's just loaded with research. So everybody, the book is out right now. If you're watching on YouTube, we'll put the link below. If you're listening, go get the book. This is a great way to understand what exactly Dr. Chris Kenobi is talking about here. Um, with these vegetable oils, like you, you make a strong case. I, I agree with you 100. percent I'm just, I'm, I'm sharing with you some of the comments I get on social media when I start talking about vegetable oils. So your answers are spot on. I completely agree with you. But let me ask you this then: What's the safe amount of linoleic acid that we can consume? Because I know it's not about just eliminating them 100. percent Just like we can't be toxic free, but what right. is the safe amount we can consume and still thrive? Yeah, that's the Perfect question, Ben, and, and the question that I started asking myself back in 2018 and 2019, how, how much can we consume? And so if we, so we, first of all, we modeled um, an American diet in 1865 before we had any vegetable oils in the diet whatsoever. And um, it, it turns out that we consumed approximately 1.1% omega-6 linoleic acid in 1865, Americans did. And we, of course, were fantastically healthy. Um, by 1909, um, that had increased to, I think, around 2.28%, if I remember the number right. Um, it, it had effectively doubled. Why had it doubled? Because we had cottonseed oil and soybean oil in the food supply at that point. Not very much. It was only about not eight or nine grams a day in 1909, I think is the number. And before that, we were getting it from like chicken and beef, et cetera. Yes. It's naturally found in there, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, you know, you will get linoleic acid in every single natural food there is. You cannot name a food that doesn't have it. You know, nature put omega-6 linoleic acid and omega-3 alpha-linolenic acid, so LA and ALA respectively, in all foods. So even when you think that, you know, if you, if you think you're getting a food that is fat-free like oranges or bananas or white rice, they all have fat. Every single thing that you can pick up and eat, I don't care if it's processed or unprocessed, it, it, and unless it's made in a lab and they've extracted every last microgram of fat out of it, it will contain omega-6 linoleic acid and you will get enough if you eat food. All right, so, so you never have to worry about getting too little. So, so back to the numbers, so by 1999, um, our omega-6 linoleic acid was 7.2 something percent, I believe, and by 2010, we're at, or 2008, uh, these are approximates, okay? I don't have these numbers exactly in my head, but um, I think it was 2008, we were at 11.8%. That is an exact number, omega-6 linoleic acid. And, the, and so we went from 1.1% in, in 1865, when we had no oils, to 11.8% um, in 2008, when we're more, you know, essentially we've gotten extraordinary obesity rates and overweight and all this other chronic disease, right? And, and you know, diabetes, by the way, had risen many thousands of fold. We can go through that in further detail. But, it, but what I did was I started looking at ancestrally living populations because this is getting back to your question, which is critical. How much omega-6 linoleic acid should we get? What should it not exceed? 
Well, there's four studies that I think are the best representative examples. In fact, they're about the only ones. They were done by Ian Pryor, P-R-I-O-R, just like the word Pryor, and colleagues in 1969. They analyzed four populations. Um, this is all in the book. That, uh, the, the New Zealand Maori, um, Europeans from New Zealand, the Pukapukans of Pukapuka, and the Pukapukans of Rarotonga. Those are two... Uh, South Pacific Islands, and they did body fat and fatty acid analyses, and um, and they ran those with good, you know, with gas chromatography, the perfect way to analyze body fat, uh, uh, fatty acids, and it turns out that the the um, um, the average of those, I could give the individual numbers, but the average of those in omega-6 linoleic acid in their body fat was 2.86%, okay? Where are westernized populations today? 7 to 12% omega-6 linoleic acid in their body fat. Americans were at 9.1% omega-6 linoleic acid in our body fat in 1959, all right? 9.1%. Um, By 2008, we were at 21.5% um, in our body fat. It's so, where so where should we be? It should be under 3% if you're on an ancestral diet is where it really should be, maybe 4% maximum. But like I said, westernized populations are 7 to 12% omega-6 linoleic acid in your body fat. As I mentioned right at the beginning, these fats accumulate in our body fat and set up this pro-oxidative, pro-inflammatory, toxic, and nutrient-deficient environment, which is per a perfect setting for heart disease and cancers and diabetes and metabolic disease. That's what it all stems from. So again, we're just being poisoned with this, Ben, and... And you know when you when you consume poison, it poisons every biological system. The poisons are not selective generally. There's almost no selective poisons. You know if you consume arsenic, it poisons everything. And and, and, I, and I've made the comparison um, even in the book. I uh, I believe I did. It's in, it's in my head a lot. But but you know arsenic arsenic has a lot of parallels. Um, to uh, vegetable oils. Why? Because they're both pro-oxidative. And it is oxidation in the body that is by far and away the worst driver of chronic disease. It's oxid It's not inflammation. It, number one is oxidation by far and away. It's like we're rusting inside. Mm -hmm. And these, these omega-6 and, ome and even omega-3 um, fatty acids, they're prone to oxidation because of the double bonds. And when they're attacked by free radicals, which there are gazillions of in our bodies all the time, that, you know, this sets up an environment to, for us to essentially rust inside, oxidize inside. And, in this, and, and, and this also produces these downstream metabolic um, advanced lipid oxidation end products called ALs, which are things like 4-hydroxynonanol, yep. malondialdehyde, those are 4-H&E, uh, malondialdehyde MDA, carboxyethylpyrrole, pyrrole, acrolene, um, 9 and 13 hove, the list goes on. There's hundreds of these different, different chemicals that collectively are cytotoxic, genotoxic, mutagenic, carcinogenic, atherogenic, thrombogenic, obesogenic, diabetogenic poisons to yeah. us, right? And they and some of these like acrolein are shared in, you know, they're they're in vegetable oils and they're in they're in cigarette smoke. And you get a lot more out of them in high doses of vegetable oils than you do in cigarette smoke. Mm. And so acrolein is the primary toxicant of cigarette smoke, probably the, the primary mutagen carcinogen in cigarette smoke. And you get a whole lot more out of these in a large French fries, uh, a large McDonald's French fries I've shown in the book it is the equivalent to, in terms of acrolein exposure, is the equivalent of smoking 18 to 26 average cigarettes or up to 97 cigarettes that are the lowest in acrolein. And all this data is proven. This is all done. Martin Greutfeld in the UK did all this, this, these analyses on um, the content of acrolein in heated vegetable oils. And um, the, the tobacco companies that were required to do all this research, they've shown how much acrolein there is in their own cigarettes, right? So the, 
That's coming from tobacco companies. So yeah. I just put the data together and figured out you know, how much is it equivalent to. So you you know set your little child down. We have a picture of this in the book. You know to a plate of French fries. You might as well be allowing him to smoke mm. or so, forcing him to. So what I'm hearing is that if you had an option between smoking cigarettes and eating vegetable oils, which option would be more detrimental? You're saying it's the vegetable oils. As well. Absolutely. I would choose smoking any, if I had to choose between the two, I would smoke every single day before I would consume vegetable oils. Me too. Same. I would smoke, I would be a pack a day smoker. And in fact, you can see, you know, significant populations like the South Pacific Islanders, um, the Catavans, for example, you know, the, the, they, there's a lot of smoking on those islands. And these people, um, like the, uh, the Papua New Guineans of Tukacinta, there's lots of smoking, but these people didn't have, um, they don't tend to get lung cancer, for example. And they, they're, they seem to be much less susceptible to emphysema, to COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. Why? Because of their, their diet protects them. You know, Weston Price reviewed this extensively in these, these populations that lived in these smoke-filled huts in, in the Outer Hebrides of Scotland. They, they, they were exposed to this constant smoke year round, but they didn't, they didn't have tuberculosis and they didn't have, they weren't dying of lung disease. You know, they remained healthy because their, their densely nutritious diet of seafood and oats protected them. It's the, what we see all around the, you know, all around the world. There's many examples of this. So I, I, I certainly, again, I'm, it, you know, I'm not suggesting anyone should be smoking. It's, yeah, we're it's not a terrible thing. That, yeah. But, you know, but modern, you know, allopathic medicine, uh, you know, it presents the story as though smoking is by far and away the worst absolute thing you could do to yourself. I, I, I vehemently disagree with that belief system. The evidence does not support that at all. I think it's a processed food, vegetable oil laden diet is it, tr tremendously worse than smoking. Yeah. When I asked Dr. Kay Shanahan, she said the same thing. I have did a, she? Yeah. Yeah, she did. Yeah. I said, what's worse, smoking cigarettes, eating sugar each day or vegetable oil? She said, that's easy. It's the, the vegetable oil. So same yeah. Thing said. yeah. Yeah. Um, quite, so I want to make a distinction here. I'd love to hear your thoughts on this because I, from my research and my understanding, and you've done way more than me. However, there is a difference between adulterated omega-6 fats, those that are heated with these detergents, et cetera, versus those that are unadulterated, right? Um, can we make that distinction? And if we do, let's say somebody's consuming like a, um, a sunflower oil that is organic, cold pressed, and they're not heating it, they may be using it for like a salad dressing. Would they have more flexibility with that three to 4% where they, would they potentially be able to consume more because it's not adulterated? Are you saying all of them we should limit? Hey, I want to take a minute to share something with you as we take a break from the video you're watching. You know, one of the most common things I see to why people don't have enough energy levels, they have trouble building lean muscle mass, they have brain fog, fatigue, and they don't feel good is because of a deficiency in a hormone called testosterone. Now, testosterone is a very important hormone to have in a healthy amount for both men and for women. So how do you reclaim your vitality? How do you reclaim this very important fat burning and muscle building hormone well, you can do it with a powerful supplement called Upgraded Tea. It has been my go-to for naturally elevating testosterone levels. Upgraded Tea is from Upgraded Formulas, and it contains the highest quality of ingredients that have been proven scientifically to increase testosterone production. Now, as I mentioned, if you're a woman watching this, this is very important for you just as a man watching this right now. Upgraded tea is a natural and safe way to boost testosterone levels. When you boost testosterone levels, it's going to increase your sex drive, vitality. It could help replace fatigue with all-day energy. It'll help you lose that stubborn belly fat. Uh, testosterone is required for fat burning, so it'll help you with the last 5 to 10 pounds that you're looking to lose. It helps you be in a better mood, helps with your memory and focus. So here's the three-step approach. Step one take two capsules of upgraded tea with water every morning. It does not break your fast. You can have it with food or without food. Step number two, notice your energy levels and dominate your day with more confidence and more vitality. Step number three, wake up the next day having better sleep and just keep doing what you're doing.
as simple as that. So if you want to get your hands on upgraded formulas, upgraded tea, and any of their awesome products like their upgraded magnesium and their hair mineral analysis testing kit, head over to upgradedformulas.com. And if you use the coupon code ketosis at checkout, they're going to give you 15% off your entire order. That is upgradedformulas.com. Ketosis at checkout. We're going to drop that link down below. And let's get back to today's video. Yeah. Um, well, if you're, if you're consuming high omega-6 seed oil or vegetable oil, and they're all high omega-6, um, uh, uh, if you're talking seed oils, all right? So um, if they're not heated, you will, when you consume, that oil will have less of the advanced lipid oxidation end products in the oil. However, all of these advanced lipid oxidation end products can also be produced metabolically in our bodies. So if when you elevate the omega-6 in your own tissues, which you will um, over time, these will accumulate. And as they oxidize, they can produce all of these advanced lipid oxidation end products. So if, you're con if you think, well, I'm just going to consume a cold, this is a cold pressed grapeseed oil or safflower oil or take your pick, right? And it's never been heated. Um, is that better? Yeah, it's better. But it's kind of like the smoker saying, you know, well, I'm only smoking now 15 cigarettes instead of 20. Um, you know, is that better? Or I'm smoking a lower tar cigarette or something like that. Yeah, you, you know, you probably made a little bit of an inroad, but why do it at all? I mean, you can, it's so simple. No, but here's the thing. Ben, I've never heard anyone say to me, oh, I just really miss my vegetable oils. <laughs> Nobody says that, you know? People will miss their carbs and their sweets and their, you know, whatever. Um, you know, their, their, their coffee, uh, Starbucks coffee loaded with cream and sugar and all this stuff, right? They'll, they'll miss that. But nobody ever misses a vegetable oil. And, you, and the, it's the number one thing to remove. And if you just replace it with good quality um, fat, like butter or lard or beef tallow, or you could use coconut oil or palm kernel oil, t those are both 2% omega-6 linoleic acid. Um, and possibly a good quality, authentic olive oil, which is higher in omega-6. We can get into that if you want. But, it, but anyway, you, you know, here's the thing is if you just understand this simple concept and you recognize that the omega-6 um, is uh, driving all of this disease, it's easy, I think, once you understand that, to begin to decrease those in your diet. Even if you're eating fast food and restaurant food, uh, you can, um, by ordering correctly, you can avoid a lot of that oil. Yeah, so Brian Peskin, I've interviewed him a few times and he's a really smart guy. He's written a book called The PEO Solution, which is all about parent essential oils. And he makes the case with his research that there is a time and place for high quality omega-6 and he goes into the, the metabolic pathways and he talks about PGE-1 and um, he's a big fan of them and he believes that there's a difference between the adultered ones that are omega-6 and the unadultered ones. So do you think all omega-6 are bad? Is there a time and place? Uh, I just want to make a distinction because I'm trying to find a middle ground here. Uh, I, I do. Well, okay, first of all, First of all, I think omega-6 is really good. You have to have it to live. I, you, I, you literally cannot, uh, to, in my view, I don't think it's, you, we're not, we cannot survive without omega-6. Um, Burr and Burr uh, uh, researchers back in the 1930s, around 19, early 1930s, um, began to prove that a diet had to contain fat, had to contain linoleic acid, and ultimately they determined alpha-linolenic alpha acid in, in order for animals to survive and be healthy. Um, otherwise, they would begin to decompensate in all sorts of ways, um, which began with deterioration of their skin and um, their teeth, if I remember right. Um, um, so, so you have to have linoleic acid. And, and, and I could just make a case to say, well, this is just like, we, we could draw analogies to any single vitamin or any single mineral that we have to have all of these 
but in the right amount. And there's a toxic dose for everything. And so there's a sweet spot for everything. You can't have too little, you can't have too much. You have a sweet spot for everything. And so I would argue that to me, all of the evidence suggests that anything over 2% linoleic acid is going, to, is going to set you on a path to develop much or all of this chronic disease. And, you know, just for example, Clement Ipps research back in 1989 in animals showed that he put animals, um, he put uh, rodents on uh, various diets uh, containing omega-6 beginning at 0.5% and increasing by 0.5% increments up to, I think, 12%, wow. which would be, be very similar. 12% would be very similar to Americans today, yep. right? We're at 11.8% as of 2008. And then he exposed these animals to DMBA, a carcinogen, and, and then evaluated them for mammary tumors. So basically the equivalent of breast cancer in humans. And that they uh, and this is there's a graph on this in the book. I just you know just used his graph and modified it slightly. Um, but anyway, you see an increase in the breast cancer rate, the mammary cancers or tumors in these animals up until they reached 4.4 percent omega-6 linoleic acid, and then it kind of levels off and doesn't change very much after that. So. So once you're above one and a half to 2%, you've already got plenty omega-6 linoleic acid and you shouldn't have more. And if I went all of these native traditional living populations I've looked at, they're all under 2% omega-6 linoleic acid. I can't, I mean, so far, I don't think I've seen any that were completely ancestral that were above 2%. If they were, they're not, they're not much above that. Okay. All so, right. Yeah, so, and it's going, as I said, once you go up higher than 2%, you're going to drive cancer, you're going to drive heart disease, and I think you're going to drive, you know, uh, insulin resistance and, all, and virtually all the metabolic disease. So it makes no sense to me to, to look for a good, you know, healthier type of uh, fat. These are not natural, Ben. The, you know, if you think of processed, Vegetable oils are the single greatest component on a caloric basis of processed foods. And this is where there's a disconnect because nobody argues that processed foods are the problem. Nobody argues that. The you know, American Heart Association to the World Health Organization, the Pan American Health Organization, all of the major institutions that all tell you processed foods are bad. What is the number one component of processed foods on a caloric basis? It's vegetable oils. Yeah, yet the American Heart Association has their stamp of approval on that canola yes. at the grocery store. So let me ask you this then. <clears throat> How do we measure what levels of al linoleic acid we have in our body fat? You, you mentioned that study with, uh, what was it called? Um, chromatology. Uh. Oh, uh, gas chromatography? Uh, yeah, I mean, how, yeah. how do we do that? Like, how do we know yeah. how many percentage we have? You. Uh, yeah, it's, it, it's not a test that you can just go have done. Right. Um, and I, I'm so far, I'm not convinced that, uh, well, if, if, if you do, if you do analyses of the omega-6 and omega-3 fatty acids, the fatty acids in your blood, it will, it will be very, very reflective of what you've recently eaten. Right. So it's, it's not, I'm not convinced yet that there's Either. enough evidence that, that we can really test this by analyzing the blood. Um, the evidence is just not there yet. I'm not saying that it won't be at some point. Um, maybe that's possible, but you, but the, but it, the way it's been done in all the studies is an adipose biopsy. So you biopsy a little tiny bit of fat out of your, 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 your butt, your butt, um, or off of your abdomen. And that is sent in for a fatty acid analysis. Um, it has to be done with a gas chromatography or high performance liquid chromatography. And uh, which has been available, by the way, since 1952. And so wow. all of these studies, have, they're, you know, I, I would never quote anything that hasn't been done with one of those technologies. Um, but anyway, that's how you'd measure it. But I can tell you that I, I've never, so I, I've never had a, an adipose biopsy to analyze my fatty acids. However, I have been on um, an ancestral diet now for about 12 years. And um, in other words, you know, virtually seed oil free. And so I would expect my body fat is less than 3% omega-6 linoleic acid. Now, and I'll just tell you very quickly that 
the half-life of omega-6 linoleic acid in the body fat is 600 to 680 days. Roughly, it's two years. Yeah. And so the, it takes a long time to increase the omega-6 in your body fat, and it takes a long time to reverse it. You can All of your fatty acids in your body, one study showed, can be turned over in three years. So when you, so, so, but here's the good news is, so you can, if you eliminate vegetable oils today, today, I believe in hours, your risk of heart attack and stroke will go down. Why? Because you're, you're already decreasing the inflammatory factors within hours. So the inflammatory uh, prostaglandins, leukotrienes, eicosanoids, and thromboxanes will all go down. Clotting risk goes down. Vasoconstriction goes down. Um, you know, inflammation goes down all together, right? So we're safer by the end of today if we eliminate vegetable oils today. You know, over the next few months, our body fat starts, you know, linoleic acid starts to go down. In three years, you will be at an ancestral level if you keep your body, if you keep your omega-6 linoleic acid consumption under 2%, which is where it should yeah, be. Yeah, that's, that's very promising. And, and, you, and you could speed it up with things like fasting and other methods to burn to use body fat yeah and energy absolutely right? yeah you could do you could i think the best way if you want to if you want to move it fast is get your omega-6 linoleic acid as low as you can and that means by the way um to, uh ben to you and everyone is you you have to eliminate all the highly polyunsaturated vegetable oils which i, I named i can name again if you want me to you have to eliminate the animals the monogastric animals that you consume that consumed corn and soy. That would be primarily chicken and pigs, pork. And why? Because monogastric animals like chicken and pigs, they're like us when they consume high omega-6 diets, and in their case, it's corn and soy, they're fed in CAFOs, and that raises their omega-6 linoleic acid in their body fat up to 20% and, and higher. So you have to eliminate those. So you're going to get your, if you're eating chicken and pork, you want to try to get those from animals that are not fed corn and soy. And that's very, there's precious few uh, farmers and ranchers doing that, but you can get those. It's a similar situation for the eggs. So you have to have eggs that are, you know, from chickens that are not consuming corn and soy. All right. There's one other source of high omega-6 and it's nuts and seeds. And so I would say eliminate those from your diet. And in, if you do those things, you get rid of the highly polyunsaturated vegetable oils, you get rid of the uh, CAFO raised and you know chicken and pork. It doesn't matter about beef so much. I can, I'll come back to that if you want. And then get rid of the nuts and seeds for the most part. In three years, you're gonna have omega-6 body fat that is down at an ancestral level. And guess what? In my view, I think you're gonna, you're gonna virtually eliminate your risks of heart attack and stroke. I think you will practically eliminate your risk of cancer. Um, metabolic disease will all completely reverse unless there's other component, other other big problems that are causing inflammation. Mm -hmm. For the most part, I think you're going to reverse all of these dreaded consequences. Macular degeneration stabilizes, and we've seen this now because I have people that have been following this diet now since 2016. That's so about almost seven years, and we see all virtually every one of these people has stabilized their macular degeneration mm, wow. and some have gotten better but the majority just they just halt they don't progress which is typical we generally expect progression so it's the same thing you see with heart disease it stops progression and it reverses and we've got one a very good friend here a phd uh researcher um uh, um gary koyen k-o-y-e-n phd um is running a, a practice in Boulder, Colorado, and he reverses heart disease using exactly what I'm talking about. Using, get, get, first thing he does, gets people off of vegetable oils. Mm -hmm. And he has, has a study, we're gonna try to publish this, 25 patients and um, oh, more than half of those, I think it was 13 of those, had reversal of their coronary artery disease on coronary artery calcium scanning. Mm. So they dropped their numbers down substantially, some of them by more than 100 points. And this is just over a year or two. Wow, that's awesome. Yeah, yeah. most people will say you can't lower that score. That's you know, <laughs> proof right there. I've seen it as well. Yeah, we're going we're gonna to publish that because it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's absolute proof and it's, un it's undeniable. It's amazing. I have yeah. a couple more. There's just so much I could talk to you about. We'll do a round two. We're already an hour. Okay. I have a couple yeah. more things to talk about. Are you game for a couple more things? Yeah, yeah, okay. absolutely. 
And, you know, speaking of testing, you know, one of the arguments I get when I make videos on vegetable oils is ah, I eat vegetable oils and my C-reactive protein is totally fine. But to your point, it takes time for that to change. And, and there's a difference between the oxidation and inflammation. But a test that I use is actually a urine test that's measuring um, uh, malandialdehyde in the urine, which is showing you like the oxidation of the fats. And I've correlated um, those who are consuming a lot of vegetable oils, because I always ask my students before they get into my program about their diet. I have them do this test, and it, the darker it turns, the more inflammation around their membranes. It correlates to the more of the vegetable oils they consume. And as we first thing we do, we remove those vegetable oils, and then we just start changing everything. Mm -hmm. Then we see those levels drop. Have you ever tested or heard about a test measuring the, the urine, the um, monodialdehyde in the urine? No, no, Ben, I certainly haven't. So everything you just told me there is just news to me. And uh, I, I really, I really like it. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's, like that's it. really interesting. Yeah. And it's affordable and you can do it at home. So I'll, I'll send you some info on that and, and you could vet it yourself. I'd love to hear your thoughts. Um, next Very question was, you know, restaurants, something that I always do. And I've heard you do the same thing. <laughs> I love that we're on the same page here. I learned this from my mentor, Dr. Pampa. He taught me to do this at restaurants because to your point, fanciest restaurants in the world they're going to have vegetable oils whole yeah. food supermarket they're going to have vegetable oils it's almost impossible but when you use the word allergic they're going to pay attention to you you're going to love this uh chris i've been telling my students to use that same verbiage for years and i always use it my fiance rolls her eyes at me sometimes but i'm like i don't want to take that hit right <laughs> yeah and i've been telling my students for years to do the same thing but they don't do it. And I think they feel uncomfortable for whatever reason. So what I have done, I created a seed oil allergy card. That <laughs> I, give, I give all my students, it says, dear chef, I have food allergies to vegetable oils. In order for me to avoid an allergic reaction, I must avoid all those oils you mentioned, the bad yeah. ones. The, follow, the following alternatives are safe, like real olive oil, et cetera, lard, butter. Please make sure they're not cut with the bad option. So I just have my yeah. students show this to the server and they really pay attention when you show this. Yeah, that's, that's great. I, one, of my, one of my best friends, uh, uh, a lady and her husband, they're, they're, they're both physicians from, uh, from England and she has she has macular degeneration and so we connected way back in i think 2016 when my book first came out and um she's the one that taught me this she said i just started telling people uh in restaurants that i am allergic to seed oils she said it's it's my body at stake and uh I said, you're right you know that and so i got the idea from her and i do i do use that um one one caveat is that uh, that we found is that some restaurants they are so afraid that even that trivial amount of oil that might be on a grill i mean like an open like a you know uh, uh, a, a, a typical fire you know open fire grill um I, I mean that might that's a pretty small amount of oil there if that's a grill hot grill but anyway um they in order to avoid that even they like if you have a steak they may cook it in foil mm. Um, is what we found. They just, without even asking, they just put it on in foil and that kind of ruins a steak. They don't, yeah, plus <laughs> they don't, don't come out get, very good. You, you don't know? want the aluminum from the foil. So that's good you to know. Exactly. That's the other thing is, yeah, then you're probably getting aluminum. Yeah. So you know? that's so, good to know. So when I make the request and ask them to grill it, I'm going to make sure they're not using the foil. And they might say, yeah, there might be a little bit of vegetable oil on the grill. I'm going to say, that's okay. As long as it's not a big amount, that should be okay. Yeah, I think if they, you know, they could even just wipe the grill and, um, there you, go. you know, and here's the thing, Ben, is um, th there's been studies of where, you know, people uh, were required to consume large amounts of oil for, for up to five months solid, and it did not change their body fat, uh, linoleic acid, at all. Really? Zero. And this was... Um, what, I, I wish I could remember the numbers, but it was a staggering um, amount of vegetable oil. One, one person in one study consumed over five months and his body fat did not change at all. His body they, fat. They measured, they me yes. the biopsy and they measured the, so yes. where, where was it going and, and what happened there? He, uh, here's the thing. I don't know where it's going, if he, if he burned it up, you know, burned most of that up. But here's the thing is, it goes back to what I said in the beginning, that half-life is really critical and you're you have to understand you can't change your adipose 
um, uh, your, your, you know, your cellular membrane linoleic acid, those fatty acids, they won't change very fast. They're stubborn in this. They're very resistant for a while, you know, and this is why it takes a long time to change them, either increase them or decrease them. So if you, if you went on a trip and you just got a, you know, you've been on an ancestral diet for years and you know, your body fat linoleic acid is going to be under 3%. I'm sure if you, if, if you, if you've done it all right. Um, and then you went on a trip for two weeks and you got a slew of vegetable oils. It's not going to change your body fat, um, linoleic acid at all. It just, it just really can't. That's the good news. I, I, again, I try to avoid all vegetable oils. And I think the easiest way to do this, Ben, in my view, in our view, my co-author, Suzanne Alexander on this, our view is, is just try to avoid them. And the easiest way to do that is just prepare your own food. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I probably consume 97% uh, of meals at home. Wow. Um, yeah. And, you know, for people that are taking their, you know, you know they're, they're going to work or whatever. And this is where you know, a lot of people are consuming fast foods and restaurant foods is uh, when they leave home, they're away from home. And I would encourage those people to consider trying to, you know, take your food with you. Yeah, um, you know where you can prepare your own food at home. You know exactly what's in it because it's hard to trust restaurants. For sure, um, you know, that, and, that, and, that, and you're just in a danger zone when you leave home and have to order out. You're right. That's the best option. So, yeah. or you could get your seed oil card for those who are going to eat out. It's, yeah, uh, seedoilcard.com for those who want it for for free. L last question is on fish oil. You mentioned the double bonds, right? We know that right. that's part of the reason why it's very aggressive at attracting, attracting oxygen. Uh, Dr. Kate Shanahan says poof is go poof because of what you just explained. And it's a great way to remember it. But yeah. uh, fish oil actually has more of these double bonds. And I am not a fan of fish oil. I, I always tell people to stop taking it because of what it does. So I want to hear your thoughts and if you've done research on fish oil. Yeah, absolutely. And th that's in the book too. And as I mentioned, the omega threes are at higher risk of oxidation than the omega sixes. Right. Yep. And this is this is all in the science. This is all proven. Um, again, the, you know, the higher the number of double bonds, the greater the the, the risk. So when you take, so I believe, um, you know, the oils, the fats from fish are are healthy, right? And these long chain. Um, omega-3 fatty acids, D EPA and DHA, the 20 and 22 carbon omega-3s definitely are healthy. And, um, but I don't think we're required to have significant amounts of those in our diet and still be healthy is, is my belief and philosophy ba based on everything I see. There's just too many populations that could never get it's true. Any significant fish or seafood. They were landlocked, yeah. Yeah, they're totally land. And, and 19th century Americans are the perfect example. Almost all of them, they didn't have access to a, a lot of seafood. They did eat a lot more oysters in the 19th century. That was pretty calm because they were canned. And so eating oysters was pretty common. But, they, but the enormous majority of Americans wouldn't have had access to fresh fish. And of course, there wasn't any farmed fish back in those days. But, but anyway, so the, um, but the omega-3, if you pull it out of the animal or the plant and you, you put it into a bottle or put it into a, a capsule, it is exposed, it's going to be exposed to oxygen to some degree, to heat and to light potentially. It's going to oxidize. And on a gram for gram basis, if, you know, the studies show, if you look at the oxidized, the advanced lipid oxidation end products, which we talked about, those ales the, in omega threes that are in that are uh, you know in a, in a bottle or in a capsule versus seed oils, they're higher in the omega threes, hmm. which is exactly as you said. These are more dangerous. I I think that when you know people are trying to, there's only one reason to try to increase your omega threes. Uh, to try to ward off the problems of a higher omega-6. That's really what you're trying to accomplish, yep. which doesn't really work. But the, but the only methodological reason to do that, to consume omega-3s, is because the omega-3 and the omega-6 fatty acids, so omega-3 being ALA and omega-6 being LA, those, when they're converted to their longer chain uh, counterparts, 
um, omega-3 would be EPA and DHA, and omega-6 would be arachidonic acid, which is the 20-carbon omega-6. Those are converted by um, the, um, the elongation and so the desaturase and elongase enzymes. So those, the omega-3 and omega-6s share the same enzymes that convert those, the metabolites to the longer versions. Right? So if the idea is, is if you throw a whole bunch of omega-3 in there, you're converting more omega-3 to the longer chain fatty acids, right? Instead of more omega-6 linoleic acid going to arachidonic acid. Mm -hmm. and, the, and the downstream products of arachidonic acid are those products I mentioned, the eicosanoids, the prostaglandins, thromboxanes, and so on, right? And the, so these are the problematic uh, yeah, uh, metabolites, and but it doesn't. It, it, the problem is, is it doesn't really work when because it's just a temporary fix, mm -hmm. and you can't do it all the time, and you can never solve the fact that you've just got this boatload, a barn load of omega six sitting there if you've been consuming seed oils. Yeah, you're you're. It's like you know the house is burning down, and um and you have to you've got to stop the problem. At its, you know, at its root cause, and everybody listening to this is, you know, going to be a root cause thinker. We all uh, are looking to let's solve the problem. Let's get at what is the what is the main problem, and you can't fix it with omega threes. In fact, and this is in the book too. So the omega three consumption over the 20th century almost doubled in the American diet. Right, the omega six went through the roof, but the omega three almost doubled. Why did that double? Because we're getting more fish, we're getting more. Well, but the main thing is we're getting more vegetable oils. Mm -hmm. The vegetable oils have omega three, right? That's, right. That's yeah. yeah. And so, the fish oil, and fish oil consumption went up exactly. Too. The multi-billion yeah. dollar industry now. Right. Yeah. So so you you know you could you could increase the omega three through the roof you won't fix the problem right. if you've got high omega six you've got to solve the omega six problem so so i believe in getting omega threes from fish from i think that's a fish you mean yeah eating, for yeah. the real yeah. you know yeah. so so the best option would be wild caught fish and i think that's that's a great thing to do in my view i I mean, I know there's concern about toxins that are in the ocean and all that, and, and I so, but I do think eating the smaller fish that won't have right. mercury, I do think that's like salmon as an example. But yeah, sardines, um, etc. Yeah, yeah, yeah there, there's a slew of them. Um, as long as you're avoiding the large fish, fish, you know, um, like tuna, mm -hmm. um, shark, dolphin, shark. That yeah, there we go. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. those are the ones that are going to be higher in the. And, and, and so many people in our in the in our health space, educators, they're they're promoting fish oil, taking fish oil. I did for years, and so I started to come across research. Research, I'm like, wait a minute, this is this is not adding up. And I looked into the NIH and what they recommend, or what the average um, adult male, six foot male, would need in terms of EPA and DHA. And they said 7.2 milligrams of EPA and DHA daily is the is what is required for an average adult male, six foot guy. Pretty good, pretty, pretty big guy with a big brain, right? Mm -hmm. The average fish oil capsule is a thousand milligrams, and people are doing two grams, three grams, four grams. This is a super physiological overdose, and it's creating a whole host of problems. And people think it's a, it's a very uh, important supplement to take. It's doing a lot more damage than this Yeah, you know, I, I mean, I look at, and there's so many examples, um, but I, I love to use the 19th century Americans as an example who. Who you know they where did they get where did they get their omega three and omega six uh, or omega three long chain fatty acids they got them from mostly from beef, mm, that's right? right? And so and, and is and there eggs, is right? there enough there? Egg. Egg, sure, yeah, yeah, absolutely. And is there enough there? Uh, to me, absolutely. So I don't think we need significant, you know, we we need large amounts of these omega threes of any type. I just don't. That makes no sense to me because we just I just don't see the chronic disease in those populations that can't get seafood, for example. That's right. And there's lots of populations around the world. The Maasai are a perfect example. Yeah. You know, if they're not getting any seafood, they're not getting any fish. You know, their diet is milk, meat, and blood. Mm -hmm. Right. And the huge majority of their diet is a liquid diet of milk, milk and, and blood. And so where, where are they getting? How are they, get, you know, not getting uh, all of these diseases if there's if we have 
to have omega threes. They're not supplementing, <laughs> you know, and they're they're not get, you know, they don't get they don't get fish or any seafood ever. So, but this is typical if you look around the the you know the, around the world. Most populations are as you said, they're landlocked. Yeah. Yeah, well said. I always finish every conversation with um, a supplement that I call vitamin G, which is gratitude. And I want to ask you what you are grateful for today, Chris. I'm grateful, ironically, for the fact that I developed arthritis mm. um, because it led me down this path of a greater understanding. And without that, I, w I wouldn't be here today. I'd probably just be uh, suffering and uh, some, from some other thing, <laughs> you know, from from a, uh, a standard American diet, which I was, you know, kind of on until I was 50 years old. So I, um, I, I was always trying to be healthy, but I just didn't know how. So, yeah, yeah that's what I'm, I have gratitude for that. That's, uh, that's amazing. Tony Robbins always says, when you find the meaning in your suffering and in pain, you begin to master your life. And that's exactly what you yeah. just said. Where, so your book is out, uh, The Ancestral Diet Revolution. You can get it now. We'll drop a link. Anywhere else you want them to go, check you out, website, social media? Um, well, yeah, we have a, a website for Cure AMD Foundation. It's at cureamd.org. And we have a, a website in progress for the Ancestral Health Foundation. And that will be at ancestralhealthfoundation.org. We do have uh, Facebook pages. For both of those organizations that uh, my co-author um, Suzanne Alexander uh, runs those and um, what else I'm, I'm, I'm on YouTube with a lot of uh, presentations and uh, yeah so they can find me in all these kinds of places like I said uh, Ben I consider myself a public health advocate more than anything and, and a researcher so so um, I appreciate uh, everybody just uh, 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 viewing this and, and learning from this and spread helping to spread this message because that's our goal. Yeah. Well, we appreciate you, Chris. Thank you for your tremendous amount of research. And uh, your book is a valuable resource for those who are, my audience avoids, they try to avoid these vegetable oils, but I'm sure they're getting a lot of backlash. So you just share the research you're going to get from this book. Everybody get the book, the book here well equipped so you know how to handle yourself when you get people saying otherwise. So Chris, thank you. We got to do round two. I appreciate uh, your work and thank you so much for coming on the show. I'm glad we made it happen. Yeah, I'd love to do round two as well, Ben. And thank you so much. Just, I appreciate it. It's an honor and a pleasure to be here and I appreciate you.